Okay. I'm going to shut and off we're my gonna video We're going to start now. recording. You can shut off your video and mute yourselves. Okay. Um, aloha, everyone. Welcome to our third webinar. And we are broadcasting live on Facebook. And we are recording this webinar for the future. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, any patience with our technical difficulties, as it can be um, kind of an adventure to use new software. But today we're going to have Molly Murphy, our plant pono specialist at BISC, presenting on invasive plants and uh, beautiful native plants and pono plants, which are non-invasive plants. And she's going to be sharing with you our plant pono website and some ways to use it and just kind of helping you to become a good neighbor and a good resident in Hawaii to plant pono. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Molly. Are you able to right, uh, share you. your screen and all that? Let me share it. Okay. Can, can you guys see it? Yep. All right. Well, thank you everybody for coming. Um, this is going to be a fun and exciting presentation and I hope everybody learns a lot and enjoys this time. So sit back and relax and I'm going to do my favorite thing, talking about plants. Okay, so first we have to start in the beginning. Here we are in Hawaii, in the most geographically isolated place in the entire world. We are surrounded by 2,500 miles of Pacific Ocean, and Hawaii was never connected to a continent. Instead, lava boiled out of the ocean to make the land that we see. We went from molten lava rock to one of the most botanically diverse places in the world. So how did everything get here? Well, of course, waves, wind, and wings. Now, anything that arrives to Hawaii without the help of humans is considered native. So anything that arrived via waves, wind, or wings is a native plant. Some plants like nalpaca floated on the waves. And if you ever look at nalpaca fruit, it's almost like styrofoam. It is perfectly adapted for ocean dispersal. And we know that it can float in the ocean for more than 230 days and still germinate. Not many species can do that. So nalpaca is native to Hawaii, but it's also native to other places. It's native to many places around the whole Pacific Basin. So nalpaca is indigenous. It's native and it's indigenous because it's native to Hawaii and native to other places as well. A few plants arrived to Hawaii on the wind. What a miracle of life. Ohia and three species of orchids somehow got caught in a jet stream and flew all the way to Hawaii. But birds by far are the most, most of our species got here via birds, either stuck in their muddy feet, in their feathers, in their gullet, in their stomachs, and then they, they poop them out. So all of these species had two things going for them, dispersibility and luck. I mean, this is really a miracle of life. And then once they got here, they had three, thirdle, three hurdles they had to overcome. One was arriving here, the other was establishing once they were here, and the third was finding a mate. 272 times this happened. This is a highly improbable colonization. 272 times species successfully made it to Hawaii and then once here they found their ecological niches and they evolved into 1400 new vascular species. These plants are found nowhere else in the world. They adapted just for Hawaii. So we call these plants endemic. During this time of evolution it was a time of harmonious competition and working together. Well, the plants lost defenses like thorns, spines, and bad taste. They simply didn't need them. 
evolution is really efficient and it takes a lot of energy to maintain those defense systems. So they were lost. And besides, why would you need them? They had the best security system you could ever hope for, the entire Pacific Ocean protecting them from new invaders. Honey creepers are one of the best examples of speciation and radiation. Two foundling pairs made it to Hawaii, likely on a jet stream from Asia. Somehow they landed on Hawaiian shores and found a mate and established. Do you know that these, most of these honey creepers actually mate for life? They find their love and they spend all day singing love songs to each other and eating food. Their beaks all adapted to the different kinds of food they, they eat. Maybe they sip nectar or they eat insects or they eat seeds. Lots of adapt adaptive radiation. Look at these two. It's like they were made for each other. This eevee and this Hawaiian mint flower, they fit perfectly together. Yeah, okay. It's like they were made for each other. And this Hawaiian mint, it actually has no scent because that's one of the defenses that our native species lost during evolution. So for 70 million years or so, Hawaii was the most isolated place on Earth. But then the first Polynesians arrived. I like to call them the first botanists because with them they brought 50 to 70 new species never before seen in Hawaii. And all of these plants were crucial for the new colonists. All of them shared similar characteristics. <clears throat> They're all found throughout Polynesia they're all incredibly useful to the new uh, Polynesians that arrived in Hawaii. They're still very important for Hawaiian culture today. And most of them could not have arrived to Hawaii without the help of humans. All of them had a myriad of uses. Look at the tea plant. My old professor, Fred Stone, used to call it a Walmart in one plant. Have you ever thought of all the things you can get from it? food wrapping for hot and cold food, disposable plates, skirts, rain gear, sandals, roofing, spiritual protection, medicinal protection, boundary delineation, tracks for ancient sledding. And today we use it for horticulture and we breed it with all kinds of beautiful colors. Coconut, it's another Polynesian introduction. This tree is useful from the fronds all the way down to the roots. The coconuts give us water near the ocean where there's often no fresh water. And that coconut water gives us electrolytes and lots of good energy. The fronds, you know, are useful for, for thatching and making hats and all kinds of other things. The roots though are really important because it prevents erosion on the beach and beaches are always being eroded by the waves. So the coconuts help hold in the sand. And hala. Hala is a, it's a bit of a different case because it's actually native and Polynesian introduced. The Polynesians could not have arrived to Hawaii without hala. They wove their sails out of hala and that's how they made it to Hawaii. So I keep talking about terms and I'd like to take this minute to talk about non-native terms. There's a lot of words that mean non-native. Alien, exotic, non-native, Polynesian introduction, canoe plant, non-indigenous, foreign, non-invasive and introduced. Non-native does not mean bad. Some of these plants are incredibly useful. What would Hawaii be without lychee? in Puakinikini, in Plumeria, in pineapple. These plants are all very important to Hawaii. They're woven into the fabric of our society today. So I just wanna say non-native does not mean bad. 
but invasive species does mean bad. Rats were brought by the Polynesians. They were likely a stowaway on their canoes, but invasive species is a federally defined term, and it means it is not native to the area under consideration and whose introduction is likely to cause harm to the environment, the economy, human health, and Hawaii added another layer, way of life. Invasive species does not mean weed. A lot of times they're used interchangeably. A weed is really something, it's an unwanted plant. Well, back in the 1950s, the territory of Hawaii put out a book called Weeds of Hawaii's Rangeland, and they listed Pukiave, Aali'i, and Puakala, all native species. They listed them as weeds. Well, to these ranchers, it was weeds because they were growing in a place where grass would have been more beneficial to the, the cattle ranchers. So you could call those native species weeds, but you can never call them invasive species. For hundreds of years, the Hawaiians lived in Hawaii and, you know, things were changing, but at a very, very slow pace. But then, the Europeans arrived. Hawaii eventually became known as a crossroads of the Pacific. This was a time of Pacific voyages all the time. It was very busy, lots of trading going on. Some people, like Captain Vancouver, dropped off gifts of ungulates, cattle, sheep, and pigs, and gave them to the Kingdom of Hawaii. These animals were left to roam and eat unmanaged all over the land. Also during this time, whale oil was incredibly valuable. During that time when there was no electricity in your home, you could burn wood or coal or kerosene and all of it burned dirty. The air was thick with smoke and the walls would get all sooty and the, the light was kind of dirty and smoky. But when you burned whale oil, it was bright and clean and it didn't smell bad and it was long lasting. So whaling was big business. It's almost like finding oil in your backyard. You could get rich quick and a lot of people wanted to do it. Well, a lot of these whalers love to stop in Hawaii. But did you ever hear how the whale made the mamo come extinct? In a way it did. It's a bit of a roundabout story. Hawaii, like I said, was a, a perfect stop for, for whalers and sailors. Well, one time in 1825, this ship called the Wellington stopped off in Lahaina Harbor. And on their ship, they had caskets of water. You know, you gotta drink water. What do you think was in the caskets of water? Yep, mosquito larva. And these people dumped their water in a place in Lahaina where it pooled, perfect breeding ground for mosquitoes. Meanwhile, the pigs that were dropped off interbred with the Polynesian pigs, and they're roaming around unmanaged, doing what pigs do, riding up the ground and making more standing water. And other perfect breeding ground for mosquitoes. Can you imagine Hawaii before mosquitoes? Oh my gosh, it must have been so nice. Well, a couple years later, we got two more introductions of mosquitoes. One had avian pox and the other had avian malaria. So these mosquitoes bit the birds. And remember, these native flora and fauna don't really have defenses. And it made the birds become extinct. It killed them all. They absolutely had no defenses. And right now, that's why you don't see native birds really below the mosquito line. And sadly, because of global warming, the mosquito line keeps going up and up and up. So the, mis so the bird habitat is shrinking all the time. Also, the ungulates are roaming unmanaged eating everything to nubs, and the sandalwood trade was happening, and just in general over-harvesting without thinking about the consequences. 
it became alarmingly apparent that something needed to be happen. Something needed to happen. They could see erosion happening in real time. But before I move on, take a look at this picture. This is a native forest. They still do exist. I just took this picture a couple years ago. Now imagine it's raining and the raindrops fall on top of the Ohia canopy and then they break up and slow down and work their way down the bark. Some of them soak into the bark, other pieces continue moving and then they hit the olapa and roll down the leaf and drop down and maybe then it hits the brucacea fruit, the conavao fruit and kind of like impermeates it and then drops down to the ground again. And then it hits a forest floor full of ferns and leaf litter. And then below that, that leaf litter, all these roots of, of different sizes are, are in the ground, perfect for soaking in water. This whole forest is a perfect place to capture water. It slows it down, it holds it, and it gives it back when it's needed. It's kind of like a savings account or an investment account but for our water, which is a vital resource. Now imagine you're outside and it's pouring rain. Maybe you're at one of your kids' AYSO soccer games and you're under a tarp or an umbrella. What happens when it's pouring rain? The water is just gushing off the sides forcefully, like crazy forcefully. And then on the ground, it starts to pool really, you know, it just ponds. Well, that, was like Oahu in the late 1800s. This is not a water main break. This is St. Louis College sometime between 1850 and 1905. Water just ran down in sheets off the mountainside and pooled down below, muddy and stagnant. The land just couldn't accept the water. It wouldn't soak it in. Have you ever had a potted plant that you neglected to water? You look at it and you notice it's all wilted and then you go to water it. You can't just pour water on it. That water is just going to run out the sides and, and just run out the bottom. The plant, the plant cannot soak it up. You kind of have to prime it. You have to put a little water in, wait a minute, let the plant soak up that little bit because when it's so dry, it can only take a little at a time. And then you continue watering it slowly until it can accept the water and the soil's primed, and then you water it normal. Well, that's basically how the earth is. If it's completely dry, it's water phobic. It just, it just can't um, permeate water inside of it. Um, so Hawaii needed a quick fix. Unfortunately, at the time, they did not think that native plant communities were efficient in capturing water and, and storing the topsoil. So naturalists raced around the world trying to find the quick fix. And guess what? That quick fix was Albizia. Joseph Rock honestly thought he was saving the day by bringing Albizia to Hawaii. It's kind of funny, he wrote that he didn't think it would have much longevity here but its only redeeming quality was that it makes it self seeds. I wonder if he rolled over in his grave when he learned those same trees that he planted were cut down a couple years ago at a cost of $900,000. Albizia absolutely does have longevity and it's the fastest growing tree in the world, but only in Hawaii. In its native land, it has different predators and other forest communities to keep it in check. Here in Hawaii, it has nothing to keep it in check. So it just, it grows profusely. And that's the thing about Hawaii. A lot of plants and animals aren't invasive anywhere in the world, but you bring them to Hawaii and then all of a sudden they're invasive. But we can't blame Joseph Rock for this he didn't have the tools that we have today. The Hawaii Pacific Weed Risk Assessment. This is a vetting process for plants and it's 90% accurate in predicting if a plant will become invasive. It was developed for Hawaii with, in Hawaii with Hawaii in mind. 
It's objective, science-based, repeatable, transparent, and reliable. And all of these factors are crucial while vetting a plant because often we form bonds with plants. If we find them to be beautiful or useful, it's really hard to objectively assess them. So this system kind of takes the emotion out of predicting if the plant could be invasive. It asks 49 questions about domestication and cultivation, climate and distribution, is it a weed elsewhere, what undesirable traits does it have, how does it reproduce, when does it reproduce, how does it disperse, and how long does it persist? So these are all a, a weighted, it's all a weighted score and you add it up when you're done. And if it's less than one, it goes in this category, and that means it's low risk of becoming invasive. It's a pono plant. If it's above six, it's likely to be invasive in Hawaii. And then there's this gray area, one to six, which means evaluate further. Usually we get that because there's just not enough published information to answer the questions. We just if, if you can't answer the questions, then it comes out, evaluate further. So that's a plant that we kind of keep our eye on and, and keep researching and seeing if new published reliable information comes out. Clydemia, other people call it Coster's curse. This, I think everybody can agree, it's invasive species. I don't know anybody that likes it. Has it been domesticated or cultivated? Definitely not. Nobody in their right mind would grow this vile plant. Climate and distribution. We know that it thrives in Hawaii's tropical areas. We know it's a weed elsewhere. We know it has undesirable traits. For reproduction, we know that it can reproduce in six months. And guess what? It makes 10 million seeds a year. If you line those seeds up, have you ever seen how tiny they are? You line them up end to end and you get a 3.5 mile chain. It's insane. Uh, we know that it's bird dispersed and we know that the seeds can lay dormant yet viable for at least four years. Like imagine you're walking in the woods and you step on a clydemia fruit and it's in your boots and as you're walking later on, it, somehow gets off your boots, it can lay there and wait for four years for the right conditions to grow. So how do you find these Pono plants? Okay. You can go to the Plant Pono website. There's a few ways where you can search. You can go by designation, evaluate high risk, Pono plant. Oops. You can um, put a name in the search box. We like to click on find a Pono plant. This is the exciting one. Again, you can search by common name, but maybe you're looking for something that's native. Maybe you're looking for a cactus or a large tree or a ground cover. Perhaps you have some kind of color palette that you're interested in. So you want something primary. Elevation range is really good because that will really let you know if it'll grow in your area. Edible, you know, do you want something, a food forest or something? Sometimes you need to know about salt tolerance if you live by the ocean. Sunlight, maybe you have a full shaded area or full sun. Drainage is kind of important. And then propagation method is fun because it lets you know if you can do it by seeds or vegetatively. And imagine you're at a friend's house and you see a plant that you really like and they will give you clippings of it. You can search this plant and see how to grow it, how to propagate it. Maybe you just need a clipping and put it in a pot and then you have that plant. Then you can further search this website looking for aquatic plants, maybe you want to start a bonsai farm, container plants, maybe you have a small lanai and all of your plants are going to be in a pot 
or you're looking for cut flowers, or you live on a steep hill and you need something with erosion control, or maybe you want a hedge because you have nosy neighbors looking at you, or maybe you want to fill your home with indoor plants. We could go on and on. Medicinal. So right here is I'm looking. Do you see all these icons? It's set to green, meaning these are all low risk species. So none of these should uh, escape cultivation. Let's look at one plant. I call this one baylay. Other people call it edible hibiscus. Uh, it used to be in the hibiscus family. So, well, it's in the hibiscus family, but it used to be in that genus. So that's why some people call it edible hibiscus. So on this page, again, I can see right here that it's a pono plant. I can see when it's screened. I can see all the characteristics that I um, searched for. There's a little bit of history here and, and recipes. I know how I could use it if I wanted to. I know there's no dangers. I can learn high risk and low risk traits for invasiveness. Over here we have synonyms and family. And right here, download assessment. Ooh, this is a good one. This is where the meat and potatoes is. This is where you can really see all the information and the whole vetting process for the plants to see if they're um, invasive. And if you scroll down, see a lot of these are yes and no, and each one gives you a, a one or a negative one. This one has a score of zero. But if you really wanna dig into it, you can look find an easy one. This one hasn't been highly cultivated. So right here we have the, um, the reference and right here it tells us that it's not, right, it's not, yeah, that it's not um, highly cultivated throughout generations. So that's pono plants, but there's one more thing, native plants. So remember, Native plants can never be invasive by definition. So when you look at the native plants, they don't have that, that icon with green, yellow, and red <laughs> because these can never be invasive. So these are just native plants. Same thing, you click on it. You can scroll through the pictures, read the text, look at the secondary. Um, characteristics and then it tells us plant uses wow this native vine is a nitrogen fixer that's exciting but it looks like right here it has an aggressive root system so don't plant your structures homes or water lines the plants and then there are the don't plant these plants Maybe you're trying to investigate a plant that a neighbor has because you're thinking it's invasive, you're not sure. So you wanna look it up. Usually you can look it up by common or scientific name. We're in the process of updating the website and so growth forms is not working very well right now. This should say shrub, tree, etc. So I can see right here it's high risk. This is Mexican creeper. I can scroll through and look at the pictures. Um, I can tell it's a smothering vine that's native to Mexico. It's been in cultivation since before 1871. Down here, it tells me how it, um, how it looks, its description and how it disperses. Over here, it says the bad things that it can do. Like it can cause, it can kill any host plant used as structural support and it can cause infrastructure damage. This is definitely not something you want growing over the fence from your neighbor's house because it's going to destroy your fence. And now you have the proof to tell your neighbor. And of course you can download the assessment. Uh, this one's an old one. This is an Excel one. Um, I like the PDF ones better but same thing. Uh, is it domesticated? No. There's no evidence. Um, is it allelopathic? No. 
Allelopathic means that it puts poisons out into the ground that prevents other plants from growing. We know that it doesn't have thorns or burrs. It is unpalatable to grazing animals. So all of these answers added up gives us a score of 19, which means it's likely to be invasive. And frankly, it is invasive. But the cool thing is down at the bottom, it gives you Pono choices. Instead, plants that are gonna be non-invasive. Let's look at Thumbergia. This is one of the only non-invasive Thumbergias. Uh, we can see it's non-invasive right here. We can scroll through and look at the flowers. Um, same thing, it's a cut flower or an ornamental. Gives you more, in, more information about it. But I do have to always caution people about growing vines in the jungle. It's almost never a good idea. Vines grow out of control and it be, can become a la landscaping nightmare. So there's more to this website. Maybe it's, you know, you wanna research some plant pono endorsed businesses because it's easier if you don't wanna search this website, you can just go patronize these businesses and buy plants with confidence and know they won't be invasive. Here on Hawaii Island, we have our program and Kauai has a similar program. So we can scroll down and see all of these pono businesses. You can click on them, and if they have a website, it will come up. All right, Icone Nursery. And then search, search what they have. Um, and if you want to read more, I'll explain more later, but if you want to read more about what Pono Endorsed Nurseries do to become um, endorsed, it's all written right here, but we'll talk about that in a minute. <clears throat> and then, okay, the About Us section. What if you found a plant that hasn't been in, in um, it hasn't been vetted, it hasn't been assessed? Well, right here on this page, you can request an assessment and fill this out. And this assessment will go to Chuck Chimera, he is the weed assessment specialist for the whole state of Hawaii. If you want to get in touch with me, maybe you want to become an endorsed business, just give me a call right here and we will get in touch. Down here we have Christy Martin. She is the head of the coordinating group on alien pest species, otherwise known as CGAPS. She's kind of the one that really got this whole program going. But then the ex another exciting and fun part is the blog. We're updating it regularly and we're promoting Pono endorsed nurseries. We're writing plant-based blogs. Um, right here, we have a spotlight on elemental plants and Icona nursery and landscaping, uh, extra write-up about Royal Poinciana, night blooming jasmine. Maybe you're interested in indoor plants. Did you know NASA did studies on indoor plants and they remove a lot of the toxins that we put out from our cleaning products? So it just cleans indoor toxins and makes your house cleaner and gives you more, you know, oxygen. All right, so that is the website. Are there any questions? Molly, there was a question uh, from uh, one of the uh, attendees um, and okay. Chuck did answer it but I think it's a good okay. question and you might answer it later on but people are wondering why why people are able to order um, plants off of websites or bring in plants uh, easily from outside of Hawaii without any kind of vetting yep we sure will get to that but I'll just say right now unfortunately there's really no laws regarding the importation sale and cultivation of invasive species in Hawaii. All right. So why are invasive plants so bad here? Well, they have no predators. They make many more offspring. They reach reproductive maturity fast. They're often shade tolerant or xerophytic, meaning they can live without water. 
The seeds can lay dormant yet viable for many years. They're often self-pollinating and they form monotypic stands. And nothing can be more true than Myconia. It is the poster child for invasive species. It was imported to Hawaii in the late 50s, early 60s. Ugh, I wish they never did. So, Myconia has no predators here. Makes many offspring. It makes three to nine million seeds a year per plant. And it reaches reproductive maturity in less than a year. It's definitely shade tolerant. If a bird eats it and brings it into the forest and excretes it there, it can grow in an intact native forest. And if it doesn't grow, the seeds can lay dormant yet viable for up to 20 years. It's like a ticking time bomb, just waiting for the right conditions to grow. And unfortunately, it's self-pollinating, meaning it doesn't need a mate to cross-pollinate to make a new plant. And of course, it forms monotypic stands. You look at the edge of this forest. If you've ever seen Myconia, it's, the leaves are really big. And when you have a full monotypic stand of Myconia, it's like being underneath a tarp. The tarp, when it's raining out, the rain's not coming through the leaves. But on the side of the Myconia forest, it's gushing down with force, breaking apart, breaking apart the soil. And Myconia doesn't really have a good root system, it's shallow roots. So that is just a disaster waiting to happen. This is a landslide. The whole Myconia forest just slid off the mountain um, during a rain, a big rain event. Hey Molly, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Um, I think you're, you're still sharing the plant porno page. If you're oh, talking about pictures on your PowerPoint. Oh my gosh. Jay, thank you. No problem. There, is that good? There you go. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Okay, I'll just show. These are Myconia leaves. Um, green on the under, underside. Sorry, green on the upper side, purple on the underside. I mean, I could see why it is pretty when it looks like that, and I could see why somebody imported it. But again, they just didn't have the tools that we have today. Invasive species are the biggest threat to biodiversity in Hawaii. Every other place lists habitat loss is their main reason for biodiversity decline. In Hawaii, it is invasive species by far are the worst for the native species. Out, invasive species outcompete and crowd out native plants. This is banana polka, and what you can't see is it's this whole vine blanketing a koa and a nio. This is at Hakalau Refuge. When those native trees are blanketed by this invasive vine, I, they, it steals nutrients, they can't get pollinated, they can't um, get water and food, so it just slowly sucks their energy and kills them. They don't readily percolate water into the aquifer. This is actually the Kohala watershed. This is feet and feet of sphagnum moss. Like if you walked in it before the the ginger came in, you could fall waist deep into this moss. But instead in this area, it's, they, some people call it kahili ginger, but we like to call it toilet brush ginger because really it's, it's good for nothing. It's, it's a, a doo-doo plant. <laughs> but you've seen ginger. Imagine a whole mat of ginger on the ground. That's what this ginger species does. It makes these rhizomes that cover the whole ground and water cannot get into the aquifer. It just prevents it. Invasive plants can be allelopathic. We talked about that before, but it means it kind of puts out poisons around the roots that prevent other species from growing. This is uh, ironwood, which they're allelopathic. Oh. Invasive species change the ecosystem to suit their needs. Here we have Albizia again. It is a really strong nitrogen fixer. When our native plants were evolving and living alone in Hawaii, they did so with very little nitrogen. 
And when you add Albizia, it's just a force of nitrogen that changes the whole soil chemistry. And it kind of invites other invasive species to come in. So basically, Albizia makes a whole new invasive species community. They have superior dispersal mechanisms. This is not purple alamanda. It kind of looks like it. It's called um, cryptostegia, rubber vine. Rubber vine or cryptostegia. Can you see, here we go. Can you see these fruits? It has these fruits all over the plant. And eventually it opens up in an explosion and the seeds kind of burst out all over. And look at these seeds. They're perfectly adapted for wind dispersal. This plant makes hundreds of fruits thousands and thousands of seeds. And it can grow in no water. This plant is invasive in um, Kona areas. We, this is one of BISC's target species for eradication, and we're getting pretty close to getting it off the island. This was one of our last plants to get. But we have to keep going back to the areas where it was and keep doing sweeps looking for cakey growing because of all those seeds that it makes. Oh, also, when you cut it, it emits this, um, this sap. And if you get it on your skin, it is horrible. It gives you such an allergic reaction. And invasive species do not trap in and hold the soil. This is a picture of a muddy coral reef. When there's no forest, there's nothing to hold in the soil. And it comes down the mountainside all the way into the ocean and smothers the coral reef. From the mountain to the ocean, invasive species affect Hawaii in a negative way. So I keep talking about escape and naturalize. I should take this time to explain it. We explain it as the seeds got away from the parent plant on their own without the help of humans, moved somewhere else away from the parent plant, and then once there, they grew unaided by humans and made more fertile offspring. That's called escape or naturalize. Usually that takes a long time. In Australia, it takes an average of 149 years. Europe, it takes even longer, 170 years. Here in Hawaii, an average of 14 years. These are all woody species, 14 years to escape cultivation. Autograph tree is a perfect example. Unfortunately, it's a kind of a popular parking lot tree here in, on Hawaii Island. Autograph tree makes hundreds of these fruit capsules. The fruits open up to reveal these juicy red seeds that birds love. Birds eat the fruit, I mean, they eat the seeds, they move away, and then they poop them out. This is an, an actual picture of bird poop with autograph seeds in it. Autograph is further worse because it's semi-epiphytic. So when a bird eats the seeds and lands on another tree, that autograph tree can grow and it will grow and grow, stealing nutrients and then put roots down the tree to get to the ground. And then it eventually, it'll take it over and strangle it. If you are on Hawaii Island and you go to the Hilo Courthouse or the Pahoa Department of Motor Vehicles, Look at the lolu palms there. It's really sad. There's autograph tree going in them and it's really high up. I don't know how they're gonna get up there to, to pull it out. Autograph tree took 14 years to escape cultivation. And it's one of our bisque's no-grow species that we will talk about later. This is what the page looks like for autograph tree. It's just half the page, but we can see it's invasive. We can learn invasive characteristics. Do you remember all those sweet honey creepers that make for life and sing love songs to each, to each other? Many, a majority of them are extinct because of invasive species never to be seen again. The ecological cost is enormous. They have these highly specialized relationships with the native plants. If we don't have the bird, how are the plants gonna get pollinated? You can't have one without the other. And why do we have so many invasive species here? Well, there are seriously no laws. 
about importing, cultivating, selling invasive species. It's legal to import more than 99% of the world's flowering plants to Hawaii, no questions asked. I, I took this picture in a big box store. I mean, why are we importing herbs and vegetables? I mean, can't we grow them here and sell them here? It's up to us to do the right thing because our laws will not protect us against invasive species introductions, even with all the inspectors inspecting. And it all starts really simple. This is a night blooming jasmine for sale at a store. Totally legal to sell it. People like to buy them. Um, I don't know why, because once they start growing, they get all leggy and I don't think they look good as a bush. But people buy them because of this noxiously sweet scent that it puts out. Some people enjoy it, but other people get migraine headaches and horrible allergies. I've gotten calls at the Big Island Invasive Species complaining that neighbors were growing this plant. But there's nothing I can do because it's legal. And of course, Night Blooming Jasmine makes these fruits that of course, you guessed it, the birds like to eat it and then they fly away and poop it out. Well, this might not seem like such a big deal. Right here, it's just one night blooming jasmine keiki. But what you can see in the background, it's growing in a koa forest. So maybe that doesn't seem like a big deal. But drive down the road a little more and this is a mighty koa forest with night blooming jasmine covering the whole understory. When these koa trees make new seeds and drop them, they can't regenerate. They're already beat by this measly horticultural invasive species. What happens when all these koa die? We're just gonna have a night blooming jasmine forest. Is that what we want? Will that hold in soil? Will that percolate water? There are no laws against selling this plant, even as it's invading this beautiful koa forest. And who's to blame? <laughs> it's humans. We, we gotta take the blame here. The reasons we're importing plants to Hawaii is because somebody finds them useful or beautiful. Invasive does not mean useless, you know, because it was brought here because it was useful to somebody. They just didn't look at the bigger picture and think about the whole island ecosystem. We are to blame for bringing in 91% of the invasive species to Hawaii, and most of them were imported for agriculture, forestry, and horticulture. Seeds are moved around in relatively short distances by wind, water, animals, and birds but humans are by far responsible for the longest distance dispersal in the shortest amount of time. We humans have the greatest impact moving invasive species around. Here we have Metanilla. <laughs> um, there's another sign right here, but we covered it up. Metanilla wouldn't be so bad if those fruits just dropped to the ground and birds didn't like it. But guess what? Birds love to eat it. And you know what birds do by now. They eat the fruit, they fly somewhere else, and they poop it out. Metanilla is one of Hawaii's most invasive horticultural plants for a reason. This palm might not seem like a big deal to you. This is Flora Bunda Palms and Exotics. They are a plant pono endorsed nursery. Jeff and Sue Marcus have traveled the jungles of the world, hiking knee deep in mud in humidity so hot you can't even sweat to find these new species of palms and bring them into cultivation. Now, of course, they always use the Hawaii Pacific weed risk assessment before bringing them into Hawaii. These palm trees are Jeff's babies. He spent 20 years growing them. When one of them dies, Jeff cries. And he's kind of a gruff man, but he loves his trees. Floribunda Palms and Exotics is a place where you will find the most species, palm species, in one place in the entire world. 
It took a lot of work and a lot of love to make it. Jeff and Sue Marcus already have enough problems in their life, and now they have to go and get their ladder, climb up it, and pull this stupid weed off their palm tree, off their baby, to preserve their palm farm. Wouldn't it be nice if this neighbor would just get rid of that whole shrub of metanilla? They're not interested in doing it. And there's no laws. So we keep talking about Plant Pono endorsed nurseries. We started Plant Pono in 2015 because of the non-existent laws. We approached nurseries and other businesses in the green industry and asked if they wanted to join. Most of them were already doing the right thing and it was a no-brainer to join. Some joined and they had some invasive plants that they phased out but they could all be recognized finally for doing the right thing. We have stringent guidelines to be a plant photo endorsed nursery. You have to discontinue the sale and propagation of our nine no-grow plants. We'll talk about that in a minute. Before introducing new plants to the market, you have to have them assessed. And if they come invasive, don't bring it in. Choose another plant. They always promote non-invasive and native plants to their clients. Once a year, we schedule a visit and I come by and we catch up and see how things are going. And of course, they always follow the best management practices in regards to coquille frogs, little fire ants, and other identified noxious pests. Let's talk about the no-grow plants now. We reached out to stakeholders in the landscaping horticulture industry and asked them for advice about plants that we should, you know, flag and try to get rid of. So together we came up with these nine plants. And the goal is to do species specific research to all the residents of Hawaii, changing one heart and mind one at a time in explaining why these plants are invasive. All of these plants have certain criteria. They're all naturalized somewhere in the state. They all score high risk on the weed risk assessment. Um, they're all in the industry and they're all particularly nasty. Like they make a lot of seeds, they're shade tolerant, or they have really superior dispersal mechanisms. Metanilla, night blooming jasmine, and asparagus fern are the most prominent um, invasive species that we're trying to get phased out of the um, out of the horticulture industry. We're happy to say that metanilla and night blooming jasmine is going down drastically, but asparagus fern is going up. For some reason, last year a lot of stores were selling um, hanging baskets of asparagus fern. And these are the rest of them. These ones are all rarely found for sale. African tulip, autograph tree, Mexican fan palm, Australian tree fern, Barbados gooseberry, and New Zealand flax. Someone's growing the autograph tree. I don't know who it is, but obviously it's being grown because it's in a lot of the parking lots here. Well, maybe it's a lot of work to use this website. Maybe you just want to make it easy and just support a plant pono business. This is the easiest way to plant pono. They chose to have voluntary biosecurity to support the local economy. So this is Icona Nursery and Landscaping. They're a family-run business. It's two twin brothers and their families that, that run it. This is a nursery manager and she's serving for little fire ants. It's one of her favorite parts of the job. Here we have ESP Nursery. We don't have a, a logo for them, but they are a mother and father and their adult son. They live in Waimea and they specialize in succulents. And gosh, their succulents are beautiful. And different kinds of ohia trees. They sell at the Kohala market. This is Michael from Elemental Plants. He uh, sells at the Hamakua Farm Hub. You can find him on Thursdays and Saturdays and Sundays or by appointment. 
And this is Pacific Ina Management, and they have a big nursery and a whole management and landscaping part of their business. Here we have Lost Monarch Gardens, and we have to give them a shout out because they just gave birth to a little baby girl named Flora, and she's so beautiful, just like them. They live in South Kona, and they specialize in doing permaculture and incorporating native plants into it. They're also really into edible food. This is Ed Rao. He lives in Na'alehu. He specializes in this plant called hudia. It's a fly pollinated plant. It doesn't smell very good. Um, it, he's using it to research to see if it's an appetite suppressant. He also specializes in all kinds of moringa. And this is Des. We have a good time when we do our annual visits. <laughs> Des sells twice a year at the, the Bayan plant sale, and his business is called Miu Loa Hiki. And he specializes in food plants, Polynesian introductions, and native plants. Another reason to buy local is to avoid noxious hitchhikers. We got little fire ants, the semi slug, the coffee beetle, likely rod. Are we gonna get murder hornets too? Buying local takes that out of the equation. We all want our gardens and landscaping to behave. No one wants their plants escaping cultivation and invading Hawaii's natural resources and cultivated landscapes. Besides being a good steward of the land, planting pono also includes being a good neighbor. The native forest is often an unseen botanical treasure and it really needs our protection. While seemingly passive, planting pono has a huge effect on the conservation of Hawaii. And remember, there are no laws in regards to buying, selling, or planting invasive, invasive species, stores sell them every single day, even as they're invading the forest. But you can support plant pono businesses or use a plant pono website before buying a plant. Tell your garden stores you want them endorsed. Return plants if you find out they're invasive. That's how you can be a good steward of the land. I want to thank you all for listening and, and bearing with me during this presentation. And let me know if you have any questions about the website or you want to come endorsed. Thank you. That was great, Molly. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. We've got a lot of folks on uh, Facebook Live who are asking, and a couple in here that are asking about um, controlling some of these plants. And, um, we do, we are working on putting together a section on controlled plants. Um, we in natural resources use products that maybe aren't available for the average homeowner. So we're, we're, we've been working on that for a year. We're actually doing tests uh, at the Invasive Species Committee um, on various methods of control and pesticides. Um, and we should have a resource out for that pretty soon. So that's not part of today's um, presentation, but we will be uh, working on that in the future for those who are looking to control. Um, but Molly, there are some people asking specifically, you know, for the um, area of the island where they live, is there any kind of resource uh, right now, or will there be any kind of resource to help for different areas? Like if you live in Kohala, or if you live in Volcano, or, you know, someplace in Puna, is there something they can look to to get uh, recommendations for what they could plant? Yes, there is. Let me, I'm going to pull up the Big Island Invasive Species page. Can you see that? Yes, we can. Okay, so, sorry if I did that fast. You can go to Plant Pono and then go down to Endorsed Businesses. And on the BISC page, it's organized by the area where you live, like West Side, East Side, in North Hawaii. Does that answer the question? And so if they were to contact any of those nurseries, they could get recommendations then for plants where they live. Yes. Yes, they can. Molly. Awesome. 
We had a yeah. specific question about um, native species in the dry okay. forest area. Is there any okay. uh, resources that you could um, provide in terms of um, what kind of plants that they could grow? This is Melanie sure. asking. Okay. So I just went on to the plant pono, I'm sorry, find a pono plant section, and I clicked on native. And then I'm going to go down to water requirements. And I'm going to look at drought tolerant plants. And now I have 41 plants that are all native that can grow in the dry area. Very cool. Yeah, the sorting feature, it's really good. There was another question about blue jade. Okay. Um, does that, is that a Pono plant? You know, it is, let's look it up. See, it's that, oh shucks. Kind of, I, I don't know if this is a similar question to what you were looking at Kavehi, but someone also wanted to know how to differentiate between the jade plant versus the autograph tree. So if you can do that at the same time. Oh, okay. That, they have different growth forms, the jade plant and, um, hold on. Um, okay, so jade and autograph tree, they both kind of have succulent leaves, but if you really look at them, the jade is much more succulent. You can't write on it, so you couldn't write an autograph. And also, it's a different growth form they're much shorter. That's how I tell the difference. All right, here we go, blue jade. Okay, so it's not invasive. Um, it was assessed in 2005. Oh, it's a fob Yeah, I just, Growing giant vines in the jungle is kind of a dangerous mission. <laughs> it's really hard to control them. That's weird that it didn't show up when I searched it. Yeah. I, the search boxes are a little finicky. I did this one in the main search box on the home page. Chuck, do you have any, um, could you describe how you tell the difference between jade and autograph tree? Uh, yeah, um, I mean, anytime you get into a, like common name, it's, it's maybe difficult to, to, you know, narrow down your focus, but I would say generally jade plants are in the, um, the stone crop or the crassulaceae family. So they're small, like you said, they tend to be smaller, succulent, uh, like more herbaceous plants to small shrubs. And um, there's a whole bunch of flower characteristics that would be different from uh, autograph tree. But the main one is autograph tree, by its name, it's going to become a tree. Once it starts to flower and fruit, there's really nothing uh, that looks like the, the fruit of an autograph tree. And you, you see them in parking lots when they drop from the trees planted there. So um, once they get to be a certain size, there's really no mistaking them. But maybe when they're smaller, you might, um, and the autograph tree isn't reproducing, you might mistake it for a jade plant. Um, but like you said, um, you can draw on a jade, on an autograph tree's leaves and you can't do that with jade plant. Yeah. Molly. Yes. I just tried to click on the South Kona nursery link from the indoors. Oh, yeah. They sold their nursery. I just found this out yesterday. They are gone, gone, gone. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Someone asked about their information. So. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I got to take that off. And then uh, we had one more. Melanie wants to know if freshly cut African tulip bark uses mulch will negatively impact the soil or plant growth. Do you know? 
Do, do you know, Chuck? Um, I don't know for sure, but I would say generally um, it's, it's in a family that's not known for its toxic properties or allelopathic effects. So I would say it's probably okay. Um, I do know that like large fragments of um, African tulip, like branches and, and larger pieces will re-sprout pretty easily. So if they're not chopped up into a fine enough piece, you could be creating more African tulip. But as a mulch, if it's all shredded up, I don't think there'd be any problems. Thanks, Chuck. Okay, I got a different, uh, different bunch of questions, Molly. Um, is your presentation available, like if someone wanted a copy of it? Did we record this? It we is have, recorded. We are recording it, yes. Okay, so how, how can we get people to get it? Um, the link will be available in a few hours. So when that's available, okay. I'll share it out to everyone who attended and on Facebook. Okay. I actually, I have a question I just thought of. If someone searches a plant and it's not on there, how can they get that added to the plant pono database? Thank, thank you so much for that question. I forgot to say that part. I think, no, I think I did say it. You can request an assessment. So if you go to about us contact, there's a link that says request assessment. And right here, okay. you can fill in the box or you can just email us. All of our information's here, just, yeah, whatever's easier. I believe Chuck has that, yeah, hipra at hawaii.edu. And yep, Chuck, right here. You can, they can directly hpwra at hawaii.edu and you will do the assessment within just a week or so, yeah? Yes. Okay, great. Are there any other questions coming in from Facebook or is anybody here? Uh, wanna I got, you? I got one more. Okay. Um, how, I guess kind of it's, they want to know if Christmas berry and lantana or if they should be added to the no girl list, but can you talk oh. about how okay. do things get moved on and off? And if, uh, just a little yep. bit more about the no girl list. So they are definitely invasive species, but to be on this list, it has to be in the horticulture industry. And nobody's selling lantana. The lantana they're selling are cultivars. It's not the same kind that we're seeing, you know, spreading throughout the island. Right, Chuck? Yeah, there's a, there's a yeah. trailing version of lantana that you sometimes see for sale. And there are supposedly seedless cultivars that may be um, less likely to spread. Yeah. Um, so the weedy lantana and Christmas berry are not in the horticulture industry. No, I don't, I've never seen anybody selling them. And in fact, Christmas berry is such a widespread weed that uh, at this point it is um, a candidate for biological control. So hopefully we'll have another tool in the toolbox to control that weed pretty soon. Okay, is that if, all from all the if, different? Um, real quick, if you want to look more into our no-grow plants, um, you can do that on the BISC website. Click on Plant Pono and go down to no-grow. And then each plant comes with a downloadable card. It gives you, you know, information, it's high risk, pictures, but then you can click on this and, and download a card that gives you more information that's portable. Maybe you need to give it to your neighbor or a friend. So it's just another resource out there. There was one more question um, about controlling the Kahili ginger. Do you know off the top of your head Franny? Uh, it's most people who are controlling Kahili ginger are using escort. Um, that's, you know, mainly what I hear. You, you basically have to kill the plant and then pull out all that root mass. So not an easy one to take care of. I know that we've had good success using 
um, Garlon, but that's a natural resources uh, product, but Triclopyr should take care of ginger. Okay, right, I'm going to stop the recording now and um, want to thank everybody for attending. I uh, really appreciate it. Molly, this was a great presentation. It was super informative. We'll hope we can have you back live again, uh, maybe okay. in a couple months. We'll do this again, and then folks can jump on and ask questions because we had a lot of great questions from the participants. Um, thank you all for being here, and have a wonderful day, and, and get out there and uh -huh. plant Pono this summer. <laughs>